the Gannon GAN technology really is uh, a way of leveraging uh, the substrate technology that was developed for Blu-ray uh, and putting that towards the lighting market. Uh, w what's interesting about Blu-ray? Um, what people found, what researchers found when we moved from LEDs to laser diodes back in the 1990s is that you could not live with these high dislocation densities that I mentioned before for LED. 10 to the 8 per square centimeter is okay for LED, is not okay for a laser diode. Laser diodes are operating at about 100 times higher current density and you have reliability failure mechanisms uh, that are caused by these dislocations and the lifetime you know, shows that. So it's a complete one-to-one -one relationship as the lifetime, as the density goes up, lifetime goes down. And so the, the good news is that uh, quasi-bulk GAN substrates were developed by hydride vapor phase epitaxy. As I said before, there's no native substrate. So what was done is the gallium nitride was deposited uh, by HVP on foreign materials like sapphire and grown very thick. And then the, the original seed was split off. And you, so you have a, it's not a perfect substrate, but you still can get dislocation densities much lower than you can uh, with a few microns of GAN on sapphire. Dislocation densities of HVP substrates uh, available today and the ones that we use are in the order of 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th per square centimeter. So two to three orders of magnitude lower than what you have on sapphire. A um, lot of other advantages to the, to the native substrate. Uh, gallium nitride, um, it's uh, you know, optically transparent, electrically conductive, thermally conductive. It's refractive index matched. It has a lot of the properties that we want, not surprisingly, to match with the GAN uh, active region. So. Um, that's why GAN on GAN kind of works. Uh, we don't need complicated device structures. Uh, this is one from one of my patents, so I feel uh, entitled to be able to, to make fun of it here. Um, but we have an opportunity for you know, very low dislocation density, very high quality material, and simplified LED designs, which I'll go to in a couple of slides, to make very efficient, very high power density emitters. Uh, we also have, and I won't go into the details of this for time, we ha also have the growth plane option. Once you go to bulk substrates, you can start talking about going off the basal plane, looking at different planes to have, that have different material properties or different device properties for um, tailoring a certain uh, device per performance aspect. Um, <coughs> this is the fab flow that we described before. For GAN on GAN, we do things a little bit different. The GAN substrate, uh, we actually use atmospheric pressure MOCVD uh, for uh, incru improved quality and growth rate. A uh, very simple uh, device flow. Um, dicing GAN can be tricky, uh, so this is an area where we spend some time working. We developed a silicon-based uh, wafer level package uh, for our technology, and um, by focusing on a unique uh, LED in terms of brightness and size, we were able to leverage that into the form factor of our first product, which is MR16 lamp. And I'll show some demos uh, at the end after the video you guys can look at, um, where we're designing an MR16 lamp from the ground up based on the advantages of the LED and we ended up with a product very different than uh, the conventional guys using low power density LEDs uh, in a shower head configuration. What it uses. Um, this is our, our little workhorse device. It's 400 microns on a side. Uh, we call it a tri-die, so it's triangular. Uh, the reason it's triangular is for these light trapping issues that I talked about before. Uh, you can get light out m much more quickly uh, in a non-parallel uh, arrangement. Um, and the light extraction efficiencies uh, we see uh, entitlement to 90% plus in, in terms of performance. Not quite there, but very close uh, already. Um, the, this, this is uh, from the Applied Physics Letter paper we had just out last week. Um, this is the uh, external quantum efficiency as a function of current density. Uh, if you're calibrated at all with LEDs, you'll notice right away this is in kiloamp per square centimeter. So this is about you know, order or two magnitude higher than people typically talk about LED performance, going, going up to one kiloamp per square centimeter. We have a peak ex external efficiency of 73%. So three out of every four electrons injected into contact produce a photon and we collect. Um, and a fairly modest group characteristic due to active region design. Um, 850 milliwatts at 500 milliamp drive uh, out here at the highest point. Um, Similar performance level to the best LEDs out there, but at 15 to 25 times smaller uh, in terms of real estate, semiconductor real estate, than conventional uh, approach. And this is what really we believe will drive uh, cost reduction. We have each lot which goes through a fab based on this technology has 15 to 25 times more light in it, or another way to think about it, it's 15 to 25 times bigger. So one lot of material with GAN on GAN technology is equivalent to 20 lots of material in a uh, conventional fab.
Um, <coughs> this is the this curve here is the best diode that I could find in the literature. It's from the Chia Corporation. It peaks at a very high efficiency at very low current of about 80 percent um, and rolls off at that at that point uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we cross over the external efficiency there about 70 percent. So beyond 70 uh, or beyond 100 amp per square centimeter, as far as I know, this diode is the best LED uh, reported. Um, this is another, uh, uh, I guess, characteristic of how well the diode performs. Uh, typically, current crowding is a big problem with LEDs because you're dealing with um, uh, balance of um, uh, your carriers, uh, either on the P and the inside, complicated contacts that are required by the fact that you have an insulating sapphire substrate or a silicon substrate that you had to remove, uh, for example, in a thin film device. Um, so, and, and these uh, non-uniformities in current density drive thermal non-uniformities and they drive RHEL issues. So reliability issues are often caused by these sorts of problems. So <coughs> this just shows a cross-section of our tri-dye operating at uh, 500 amp per square centimeter um, and just lo looking at the emission, you know, out the back of the device with the active region image, there's, you know, zero change in the power density. So the power density uniformity is extremely high. And so we don't have those same drivers for rel issues. And so we can operate our diode at much higher current density, about 10 times higher power density than the conventional diode without reliability issues. And that's backed up by rel data that we have. So our projected rel data on white at, um, the, these are accelerated operating characteristics now, 160 amp per square centimeter, 140C is about 95% lumen maintenance at 100,000 hours, which is well beyond what we need for any application. Um, to make uh, our light chip product, we put several of these uh, in a series parallel arrangement to match with a driver. Uh, and we put phosphor around them and they look like this. So that's literally exactly how big they are. So they're six millimeter diameter, smaller than a dime, and they go down into uh, the lamp product. Our first product uh, being a focus on the MR16 market. MR16 market, um, up until Sora, uh, the products just did not have the brightness, the beam quality, or the color characteristics that customers wanted. So you literally have uh, customers in hospitality and, and retail waiting and holding on to halogen um, because they have to have uh, the, the high light quality. Um, <coughs> for those customers, the most important thing is revenue generation and a customer experience, not necessarily energy savings. So the cost of ownership, even for you know other uh, LEDs, could be probably a payback within one year. And most people are trying to warranty for two or three years or more. But you have a lot of customers that will not translate over unless the color quality is there. And so with Sora, we were able to have a single beam, um, fit true 50 watt uh, performance for the first time. We released this product now this year. And uh, we have a, a whole family of MR16 lamps now. And they're all described on our website. Uh, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time. Uh, one other thing that we do that's different, uh, I kind of touch on it lightly, is we, we actually do focus on uh, a violet emitter. So we, we have to bring our energy in at 3 electron volts rather than 2.7 like the guys in the blue. But it gives us a big advantage in terms of spectrum. So this is a, a cartoon of a spectrograph of a conventional LED. There is no violet. There's a cyan gap due to this phosphor Stokes loss. And there tends to be a lack of red where people are trying to gain lumens at the expense of color quality. And for Sora's Vivid product, we come in the violet and pump phosphor all the way through the spectrum, even as a deep red, to have extremely high color rendering. And this is something we're getting a lot of traction in the market right now. We have a color rendering uh, uh, index of uh, 95 or more, depending on uh, the, um, uh, yeah, 95 for, for Vivid product and R9, which is a red color rendering of over 95. Um, may not mean uh, anything to you if you're not calibrated, but, but halogens tend to be around 100 or 98 to 100, and this is what people are used to. When you come in with something which has a very low color rendering in the 80s or so and a very low R9, the colors just don't look right. You have colors in the red that look flat. You don't see a difference. It's a problem in applications where you need to be able to see that, like in retail and hospitality. Um, you know, if you're worried about a customer experience, like if you're on a date in a restaurant, you want the colors to look good, right? It's not good if the colors look bad. Um, and uh, we got a lot of uh, kudos from this. Uh, Jim, Jim Benio is a, is a leading designer in California, and uh, he really caught on to the first samples that he got a hold of uh, for us and really said, hey, this is for the first time we have the MR16 market actually being addressed by LEDs. 
And the reason to show this isn't necessarily to pump up sore so much. It's just to kind of break open the notion that we have to live with poor quality of light because we don't. It's all a matter of really uh, getting as much as possible out of the materials technology to deliver what we all would like to have. And we don't have to you know, constantly trade off efficiency for color quality. We can work to have both at the same time and, and also cost effective. Um, and so uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I have just a kind of a reminder on the timeline here. So you know, 50 years later, we're still working on these problems. Um, they've gotten really interesting in the last 20 years or so, but there's still a lot more to do. We're far away from you know, Nick's vision of the ultimate lamp. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot more interesting innovations to come over the next uh, five to 10 years for sure. That's it. Uh, well, so again, <laughs> there's one thing that ought to be uh, a clue is this whole issue of power density, right? When I mentioned before, if we're running at 10 to 20 times the power density, we're running at 10 to 20 times less material for the product. So that is a big part of how we're able to utilize the substrate. Um, but uh, there's also other more conventional aspects. And part of the reason that gallium nitride substrates are expensive is because there's not a big market for them. Blu-ray markets, well, it's almost you know, going away, I guess. Uh, so uh, uh, and you know, sapphire is exactly the opposite. And sapphire is the bulk of the, you know, serving the bulk of the, uh, of the LED market, which is huge. Right? So naturally, you have a lot of players uh, in Sapphire, a lot of cost reduction. And gallium nitride is just uh, early on. You know, and we're one of the first companies to kind of jump on the gallium nitride bandwagon. So we're going to see the GAN substrate costs go down. Um, there's also, I didn't put a slide together on it here, but there's also other uh, new ways of producing gallium nitride substrates. In fact, Sora has our own internal substrate effort down in Santa Barbara uh, based on uh, an monothermal growth technique. It's the same. Or it's an analogous uh, technique to how quartz crystals are grown under supercritical water. You can do that with supercritical ammonia and grow uh, bools of gallium nitride uh, more, uh, uh, more purely than what is done, for example, with this HPP approach. So there's other interesting technologies that can, can come to bear. And uh, quartz is extremely cheap and very high quality. And in theory, we could do the same thing with gallium nitride. Internal, so a typical uh, device might be on 100 degrees or so. You saw the reliability data shows 140. Okay, so that gives you an idea of our entitlement. Yeah, yeah, we're a vertically integrated company, and uh, the reason for that has everything to do with the fact that when you have a, a device that can operate in a totally different regime. Uh, it's very hard to go to an OEM and say, hey, let's make a product together around this. Because the first thing that they're doing is looking for, where's my other supplier that can do what you guys can do? Right? And so the conversation can't start. And that was one thing. And also, um, there's, there's so much advantage in designing the product from the ground up, starting from the LED and thinking about the whole problem holistically. And our whole design is, is based on you know, thinking about the problem from the ground up. So um, uh, we have all kinds of yeah, interesting. For example, the, the thermal resistance of this lamp right here is the lowest there is in the industry. And it's all because we were able to um, have this very small source and a small lens thereby to open up this annular region for convective flow. So we're the only LED that really has this branch fin design. Uh, and and that, that determines the thermal resistance of the lamp, being able to draw air through those fins. And that all came about from this kind of a vertically integrated approach to design.